This is episode number 203 of the Abar Above podcast. And in this episode, we are going to be talking to spirit producer Devin Trevathan. And I know I butchered that last name and I apologize, Devin. Uh, but we're going to talk to Devin about a category spirit um, that often gets overlooked, and that's vodka. There's been some new laws that have come out um, in 2020, and we're going to talk about what that means not only from a distiller's perspective, but also what it could potentially mean for um, consumers as well. So really cool stuff. I'm really excited about this one. So let's get into it, shall we? Everyone, welcome back. And today we have a special guest. We have Devin Trevathan from uh, Liba Spirits joining us to talk about all things vodka. And I promise it's not just going to be another vodka episode. There's some cool stuff we're going to be talking about. So thanks for joining us, Devin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so you have a company called Liba Spirits. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Sure. Yes. So Liba Spirits is a company I co-founded last year with my business partner, Colton Weinstein. We met working at Corsair Distillery in Nashville, actually him in production. He was the head distiller there for quite a while and myself in the front of house, bartending, sales, tour guide, all that stuff. And we decided that we thought it would be amazing to make a company that would allow us to basically use raw materials from all over the world to make our own products. We realized the importance of raw materials when we were working in distilling and conveniently it allowed us to bypass the really large expense that typically accompanies creating a physical distillery, like a static distillery. Mm -hmm. So we launched Leave of Spirits in 2020, in February of 2020, and didn't really launch. We started the company. We started our first production run. Um, and of course, at that time, shortly thereafter, the pandemic started, but that's okay. We're still, you know, we're still going. So basically the, the concept of the, the company is that we travel ourselves to distilleries around the world, small distilleries, mm -hmm. and we actually use their equipment, but we ourselves make our products with local raw ingredients. Oh, that's so, super cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it was literally a dream for both of us. You know, we were like, what are our two biggest passions in the world? It's spirits, it's travel, it's the community at large, but let's put it all together. And we, we did it and it has been a rough run. <laughs> So the global pandemic will derail you if you're a traveling business. Yeah, and sure. not only that, but opening a business during a pandemic too, I or know. prior, just prior to a pandemic has just got to been like, you got to be kidding me, right? Exactly. I mean, there was blessings in disguise. I think that not having the overhead, the monthly overhead of a physical distillery was a huge benefit as a small, sure. you know, we are an independent company. We are just ourselves and not having to deal with that was a huge benefit, mm -hmm. but the game has changed. The game of, of spirits, the game of selling has changed irrevocably over the last two years now, gosh, two whole years almost. Um, and we're adjusting, you know, I, I kind of came up in the old school style of in-person sales, a lot of liquid to lips type of approach and that's not really that's not all you're doing these days now it's a lot online all right and we are navigating yeah well and i know corsair by reputation and i've actually had their product quite a bit uh in the past they do a, a really good job so coming from that pedigree um i'm sure it doesn't hurt you guys either yeah it was awesome to have that as the kind of background through which I learned that was my first job. My first job in this industry was at Corsair. I was lucky to get that job when I was newly 22 years old. So had, you know, my parents weren't even really big spirits drinkers. So I had like mm -hmm. no context for spirits or distilling. I knew nothing. I was so green. Well, but, it's not a bad place to start though. I mean, that's, that's exactly. pretty legit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the beauty, the beauty of Corsair and, and getting there was that it both had a good reputation, you know, it was an early craft brand, kind of second wave, I think mm -hmm. we'd consider it. And so it had a good repu reputation. People respected what they were doing, but it was also from the very beginning, extremely experimental. And so that meant that I got to witness the production of a lot of different styles of spirit and a lot of different approaches to how they're handling the raw material. And that was a great education. 
one, it sounds like it kind of set the foundation for your next step, your kind of an entrepreneurial <laughs> jump that you did um, of really thinking about the things that you love and then bringing them all into one company, um, yeah. which is super duper cool. I, I give you a lot of credit for, um, for creativity. Thank and uh, like <laughs> the hardest part is like figuring out two things that are almost diametrically opposed and finding a way for them to fit together. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was, um, <laughs> it was definitely a process. It was two things that, yeah, you don't necessarily think will go together. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem like distilling could possibly be nomadic, but you know, all things considered it's, it was kind of the perfect time because there were more and more small distilleries around the world that could, that would allow us to kind of come in and basically we like, we moonlight distill, not literally at night, but we come in during their off times. They're not using their production facilities anyways. And we're like, yeah. great, we can come in, we can pay you to use your space. You get a little bit of passive income. We get to make these great spirits. It, it all works. Yeah. And I bet even uh, the distillers are probably very grateful to have you as well, especially right now. Yeah. I mean, we have been lucky. So the first two products that we made, we made a gin in Austria at Kuenz, mm -hmm. Naturbrennerei, which is just the German word for distillery. And then a rum at Porch Jam in New Orleans, Louisiana. And both the people who run production at those two places were close friends already. We figured, well, we're working out kinks. We should be surrounded by people who are going to be pretty kind to us and, and right. show us a lot of um, patience. So that was a nice thing, but it, it did show us kind of how this can work. And we think it's very much a symbiotic relationship where everybody's help getting help from this, you know, it's, it's good for everybody. And there's a lot of potential for it to grow. There's a lot very of ways cool. that it can, it can develop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like there's no real limit of, of the things that you can launch and you know the <laughs> recipes that you can create, you know, once you start traveling more, uh, you know, once this pandemic is well behind us. Uh, exactly. I imagine a whirlwind tour of just exactly <laughs> <laughs> selling out stadiums. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like, well, that and like, okay, now I want to uh, launch an Amari. So now I'm going to spend you know, six months. Oh yeah. And look oh for yeah. The distiller and you know all these things. So it's it's super fun to think. You know, how can we take all of these familiar concepts and categories and existing types of spirit and create little mini like twists and and use beautiful raw materials and have that have some kind of effect on the flavor that somebody thinks that they're going to get and that's kind of the whole it is a little bit like exploring terroir and spirits which terroir is not typically applied to spirits sure. which perfectly encapsulates what we're going to talk about today mm -hmm. so that'll come back but we think, you know, we're strong believers that it absolutely is part of the production of spirits and that good spirits do have that sense of the place where they came from. Yeah, absolutely. So to your point, um, you know, the reason we're, we're having this conversation is to talk about probably one of the most shunned spirits in the craft cocktail world. Worst, anyway. They have the worst reputation of, of all time. Well, but it's funny because it actually started with vodka. So we're talking about vodka, obviously. Vodka. Um, so the... Uh, the, the, the negative connotation now is, um, you know, from my perspective, it all started with vodka. Uh, mm -hmm. It all started with flavored vodka. And that was kind of the, the, the gateway drug into craft cocktails. Like you saw, I can't even tell you how many blood orange Cosmos I've made in my life because of this. And, you know, <laughs> these small riffs on classic cocktails started yeah. because of the vodka movement. And then whiskey became popular when people started looking backwards mm -hmm. in these old school recipe books. And then vodka kind of got shunned away. Um, so from your perspective, why do you think that is in, in a craft cocktail consumer mind that vodka is, is not a relevant spirit to even talk about? Well, traditionally, it was not very interesting, mm -hmm. especially, I mean, it has such a really, it really has such a long and storied history, but talking about just for you know, clarification sake, the last 25 plus years, not a very interesting uh, spirit to talk about because it was neutral. It was a friend of mine coined the term, the neutral monster. That's what it was. It was a huge, huge category of spirit that was largely indistinguishable. And once you start to get into spirits and distillation and you're curious about different producers and their their products, 
why are you going to go deep dive into a category that by definition is odorless, flavorless, colorless, has no character? What's, how do you differentiate? Why is that interesting? Right. It was uninteresting for so long. And, and that's too bad because it, it doesn't have to be. Right. And that was literally like the letter of the law, right? Like that yeah. was part of the, the law of, I guess it's the um, TTB, the alcohol yes. kind of governing body. Um, yeah. So, but you mentioned uh, to me that things have changed recently, right? Yes. Yeah. So the TTB, the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, got it. Mm-hmm. Just going to call it TTB for the rest of this time because um, that's a mouthful. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the TTB up until last year, 2020, the definition for from the TTB, uh, the standard of identity for, al- for vodka included that it had to be colorless, odorless, or without distinctive character, color, aroma, and taste, I believe, and maybe odor. Um and in, it also was, you know, so just wrapped up as a neutral spirit, but with all, also without those things. And there were a couple of other standards as well, but that was very, that was an extremely important um, description for them to put forth because where does that leave distillers? That right. is going to have such a big part. And, and this is why I think it is really all about the perception. The way that people think of vodka was changed because of that kind of association. And that started, you know, now almost like a century ago, but vodka had just was dealt the roughest hand. Well, vodka producers were dealt a rough hand, a rough hand, because then how do you distinguish yourself? It all becomes a marketing game and an ad game. Yeah. And so we saw that happen with Sidney Frank and the establishment of Absolute and Grey Goose, two of the biggest continuously biggest brands, uh, started by a famous ad guy from like that, that period of time. And and he knew what he was doing. And that's, that's kind of where we were for, for a long time up until last year, even though some, some kind of renegade distilleries were producing vodkas with character over the last, I would say probably the last like decade plus, because Mm -hmm. there was that new craft distilling scene and there was interest in what you as a individual in the craft community can put forth. What's your take on these categories? And so some people were doing vodkas with character, even though that was technically, but TTB doesn't really go around and say like, that's a vodka with character. That's not a vodka at all. You know, that's, it's not really exactly how they do things, but it was technically not what vodka is. And I think more importantly, it wasn't what consumers expected. And so that left producers in a real weird kind of place. Yeah. And I think uh, I've started to see, you know, back a while ago, I started to see some evidence of this starting to pop up. Um, you know, I think I'm going to reference this in the next episode as well, but there was a brand called Carlson Vodka. Um, and I think they're out of Sweden, if I'm not mistaken, but they were the first vodka that I was ever exposed to that was so different and outside of the, what I know is a categorically vodka, because it did taste like something. It tasted like potato. Um, yeah. and that was their whole thing. It's, it's sourced from potatoes, so it should taste like potato. And it did. And the really interesting thing that, they did was they were doing a um, single origin vintage. So whatever that was yeah. for that year in this particular potato, this varietal of potato, that's what they distilled and they had different distillations, but it was fascinating to me for a vodka producer to have basically almost, you know, a vintage. Um, I thought that was the, the craziest and coolest thing I've ever heard of. Um, yeah. And now you see, you know, the source material cut, can go from anywhere from, wheat to potato to sugar beets to i mean there's some crazy ones out there now from like whey proteins and i know you probably have heard of some really crazy ones too but um (laughs) actually have you what's the weirdest one you've heard of uh probably the vodka that was made with grain that was grown in the um uh chernobyl blast zone oh my i haven't heard of this one i don't know if blast zone is the right it was in that area that was demarcated as where Chernobyl's like radiation zone had, had all been, had reached. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they, some crazy kids over in Europe, I don't know exactly who the distillery is. I'm sorry, whoever you are, but they decided to make 
a vodka from grain that was grown in that area. And of course they had to test it and make sure that everybody knew it's radiation free. There's no radiation in this final product. Right. Um, either that, or I, there's another one called good vodka in the United States. It's made in the United States. Um, and that is, it comes from the discarded coffee fruit, fruit of the coffee plant. So around the actual coffee bean is fleshy fruit. And typically for a lot of places in, in central and South America, they'll just kind of like wash it down a hill. They won't do anything with it. But of course that has, you know, for you to make alcohol, you need sugar or you need starch and that's got sugar in it. So they were able to work out a previously non-existent supply chain where they were able to get that coffee fruit. I think they turned it into like a jelly, brought it back to the United States and made a vodka out of it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard of that one before. I'm definitely going to have to look uh, up for that one. But yeah, I think the, the two craziest ones I've heard of are a local one here in San Diego called Misadventure Vodka. Mm -hmm. So they take uh, food donations from the food bank um, and turn that into vodka. So like cupcakes and croissants and stuff like that. I love that. that. That's Isn't that cool? wild. I'm yeah. so curious what that tastes like. <laughs> yeah, it's actually nice and kind of creamy. It's good. Yeah, you would uh, think so. Yeah. yeah, it would have like that like kind of roundness. Yeah, and then the other one, I, I haven't got a chance to try this one yet, but um, I think it's out of New York in your area, uh, was um, a guy that invented a way to capture it from CO2. Yes, I've heard about this. Yeah, yes. part of me doesn't want to believe it because that's like Star Trek level stuff to me. I know, this, uh, is, but I'm this is so much science. Yeah, this is maybe too much science for my brain, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I'm not a producer. I think that's super cool. I'm so curious, but what the heck are we talking about right now? Kind like, of, yeah. Pulling yeah. out vodka yeah. out of the air, out of thin air, for out real. Of, yeah, car, out, of, out of like exhaust, basically. That's right? So um, that's wild. I don't. I don't know it. I don't get it. I think it's awesome though. And I can't. Yeah, me too. I definitely want to learn more about it, but yeah, I, yeah. I have no idea how that works. It sounds very that's, technical. I mean, that's the beauty of vodka is that there's so many, it's, you know, it has this, or up until this last year, particularly had this very restrictive part of its definition, its standards of identity in the United States. And I do want to preface, I should have said this earlier. I'm going to really be talking about vodka mostly in the context of American vodka because sure. vodka obviously has also, it's global. There's a lot of different history in different parts of the world. I know mm -hmm. it best in the context of American vodka. So that's kind of mostly what I'll talk about, but it has this very restrictive, you know, or up until last year had this very restrictive, no odor, no aroma, blah, blah, blah. But you could actually make it from a huge variety of sources, like what we're talking about. And that's not the case for, say, bourbon. Bourbon needs to come from at least 51% corn. Right. You have all of this. So it actually had a lot of, vodka inherently has a lot of potential for a great variety of different flavors and products that could be very exciting. But it was kind of squashed by the definition because why would anybody want to sit there and sniff through a bunch of neutral products, you know, that's not, it's just not exciting. It's not very engaging. It's not enticing. Yeah. And I remember like I started to do some investigation early on in like the craft distilling world uh, when it first got up and running. And I remember coming across like this story, basically like most craft distillers get their vodka, their hyper spirit from one single place in like, yeah. Idaho or something like that. And then their um, take on it is basically just their local watering source. I'm sure that's not the case for a lot of uh, craft distillers, but early in the game, that was, that was kind of how you did it. And I was like, yeah, that sucks. Like, no, it, it is. I mean, it's still going to be, so that's the other element of vodka production that's important to pay attention to. And that wasn't really addressed in the change of language mm -hmm. by the TTB. Because vodka, while now able to be um, have character, it still needs to be distilled to at least 190 proof or 95%. Sure. And especially during this time period where we're trying to kind of like revive interest in vodka and kind of <laughs> resuscitate its reputation, there has not been enough of an interest to make it make sense for small producers because it's really hard for small producers to distill something to 190 proof 
in a way that makes sense for their economies of scale. Right. It's extraordinarily inefficient to do so on most of the systems that are used by small producers, which tend to be a batch distillation system or sure. possibly a hybrid system that involves a column but is not continuous. Right. There are more continuous stills being installed and and they are actually kind of making sizing changes to the types of stills, continuous stills that are available now so that smaller kind of outfits can can do that. But mm-hmm. it's not it's not a widespread part of the the industry. And so it it actually was pretty impossible for small producers to mash, ferment, and distill a vodka by That's themselves. A really and good it still point. is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think um so before we go too too much further, would you mind kind mm-hmm. of addressing some of the changes that happened in this new law, because I think it's really interesting of, and then we can talk about kind of what that means for the industry and kind of distillers and consumers next. Sure. So um, yeah, the, in 2018, the TTB opened up, they decided they wanted to modernize some of their standards of identity and the language around actually a lot of different parts of the industry. Mm -hmm. Vodka was one of them. So officially vodka no longer needed to be, a spirit without characteristic uh, flavor or character or aroma or taste, but it still needs to be a neutral spirit that is distilled to at least 190 proof and cannot be, if it's stored in a barrel, it needs to be lined in a paraffin wax, basically. So that means you can't have any any influence of barrel character. Um And I don't know, I'm probably forgetting some elements, but those are like the big, some of the big ones. And obviously it needs to come from some source of, of um, starch or sugar. And I don't know if that's necessarily in the language, Sure. but those were the big ones. The biggest one was particularly the removal of the um, description of being without character or aroma or taste, you know, the colorless, odorless, flavorless was gone, which that had been around. I don't know if you know about the story of, um, uh, Smirnoff and how that plays into what happened with I vodka. don't. Okay, so I'm not going to know. I mean, this is going to be a very simplified <laughs> retelling of the story. Uh-huh. So if you, and if anybody's ever interested, there's a really good book, King of Vodka, about Pieter Smirnoff, like the mm-hmm. original man who started the Smirnoff Empire in Russia because his life was very fascinating. But basically, by the time that... He had died and Smirnoff as a brand had already been created in Russia. Things happened where he had basically, his his kids did not have this great fortune that he had once had. And so his son actually s- sold the Smirnoff label and um, recipe to a Russian native who had moved to the United States in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And this man started the production of Smirnoff vodka in Connecticut around that time. And for the first couple of years, he was having a very hard time selling this product. There was not a lot of interest. And then some distributors that I believe were in South Carolina decided to put up a banner selling this product and said, Smirnoff white whiskey, no taste, no aroma, Uh no taste, no aroma. But that kind of kicked off. And I think it's just a, you know, as is always the way, it was a confluence of, flat, of factors, you know, post-prohibition, that period of American history, everybody got into a mixing craze. Mm-hmm. There was, it was kind of the, the heyday or, or the big development of mixed cocktails, like a Bloody Mary and a screwdriver, which we look back now and we're like, oh God, so, so basic, so inelegant. But those were largely based on having a characterless vodka base. And that, you know, they ran with that and that became actually a huge success. And I think that ushered in that neutral monster that I mentioned. That was the the birth of the neutral monster. And it only grew from there up until about like one year ago. Yeah. And what's interesting, first of all, I love that term, the neutral monster. monster. I cannot, I cannot take credit. That was my friend Zeno, Jason Zeno of Porch Jam Distillery. He coined it, at least that I know of, but I I love it too. It's brilliant. It's so great. 
Um, but uh, so I looked up, I've been doing some research around vodka and trends and kind of where we're at now as, mm-hmm. as kind of a country. And vodka is still the number one uh, consumed spirit in yes. the United States still. Yeah. still. Uh, I would have thought whiskey, but I think it's still a long ways off. I think it's yeah. quite like a billion cases or something like that is the yeah. difference or more. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's still kind of the number one consumed spirit. And I think there's a yep. lot of reasons for it, both good. And I think, actually, I think most of it's good, um, sure. you know, uh, and I think, you know, the more that people drink, the more that people get exposed to different things, they get to try different things and get more comfortable with like other spirits as well. But right. vodka, uh, in my opinion, is great. Um, and I, I great. love working with it. Yeah. So. I think it's, and, but we do have to, again, talking about just, you know, it's reputation, the perception, that's such a huge part of it because, mm-hmm people need to become comfortable with the idea of flavorful vodka and this is flavorful and not flavored because there's even that hump to get over because when you talk about i mean character is kind of like a highfalutin term to some people so maybe you don't want to use that maybe you talk about the flavor of this vodka and you're talking about the flavor that's derived from the way that you were handling the raw materials and the bacteria or yeast metabolism through the fermentation that all came through in your distillation and you have a characterful flavorful vodka but that even that i think if you said that at, you went out and like talked to 10 people nine of them would say oh flavored and they would ask about like a strawberry vodka and it's like no <laughs> not that not nothing wrong with a strawberry vodka there can right. be great great examples but that's not what we're talking about we're talking about vodka with flavor from the actual raw materials, the base material that was used to make the product. Right. So just that concept, I think, is still pretty foreign to a lot of American consumers. Yeah, and I, I'm really interested to see how this plays out in the consumer mindset. And we're going to touch on that here in a second. But I think the industry, not knowing this was coming down the pipeline, might have shot themselves in the foot with that term right? Yeah. Flavored vodka got a lot of pushback yes. because they went a little bit too far. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and own it. They went way too far. On the flavors. <laughs> like when I started seeing whipped cream and like birthday cake and like salt oh, yeah. caramel, I was like, pinnacle, yeah. pinnacle, you wild bastards. You right. Crazy. Well, and then there was even another one. Um, I'm not trying to bash brands or anything. But no, like, no, no, no. Of course not. I remember. Yes. Yeah. 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 They had the entire setup. I mean, there was probably every mark of three olives in there and it took me a year to work my way through all of those. Right. I, I mean, like, that that's incredible. Like that's a ton of investment in just flavors. That's, flavors. That's well, yeah. I think that was, you know, that was the workaround for people who wanted to create something probably around that, like, I'm sure, you know, I wasn't legally able to drink around that time, but that mid nineties kind of period where there was, I think a little bit of a turn and there was interest in cocktails and maybe right. they were, it was very far different from what we think of as cocktail culture today. And then obviously probably not as exciting to, to what we would think it is today, but there was interest in cocktails and, and somebody thought, okay, well, you can't make vodka taste different from vodka. You know, it's just this neutral thing, but you can have flavored vodka. And so there we go. Now we can differentiate. Now we can have vodka that has flavors added Right, exactly. And people went, yeah, full tilt into that. Yeah, absolutely. I remember like early in my career, you know, green apple and a Sprite. People oh, loved yeah. it. Yeah. Made I it mean, easy. Um, but it. so kind of going full circle now, you know, with this new law and the fact that flavor is no longer a bad term when we're talking about vodka. I mean, this is going to, in my mind, I think you touched upon this in the article and I fully agree with you is that this is going to require a ton of education around this now, So much. right? Like yes. Yes. It's the ideas that we have around vodka are not the same anymore. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on what we can expect coming out of some of these really cool craft distilleries and some of the flavor profiles and, and like what, what will vodka become in your hopes and dreams in the next, like say 10 years? It's, you know, that's a, it's a great question and it's a very multi-layered question because right. there's a lot of elements that have to be attended to basically. Mm-hmm. So vodka is obviously not going to change overnight just because the TTB put that out there. Um, I 
hazard a guess that most consumers of vodka are not even paying attention to what the TTB is doing. So they might not have even gotten the memo yet. So now it falls to us, you know, people like myself, yourself, passionate members of this in- industry who are interested in education to spread that message and also unfortunately have to contextualize, not unfortunately, we have to contextualize it. And like you said, there's going to be a massive amount of education required. And I don't, I mean, it's, it's going to be an interesting thing. I don't know exactly where that education needs to come from. I guess it needs to come from everybody because Mm -hmm. if you leave it up to the producers, it's tough. I've heard uh, friends who are producers in the industry say you never want to have to educate your consumer as well as make the sale because then it's just, and that's a very simplified version of a truth I think that exists, which is that if you have a kind of a, a lot of information that is required to sell a product, it's just, it slows you down naturally. Yeah. It takes a while. Yeah. Well, so, and on, on kind of the flip side of that, in order for me to sell it as a bartender, I need to tell that story. So that's going to take me away exactly. from, you know, the three tickets in my window, the four people behind this person, like that hand sell is going to be great on like a Tuesday afternoon. Um, but when I'm in the weeds, like that's the last thing that's in my mind. I'm, I'm all about volume and I'm all about like customer service at that point. Exactly. So, um, yeah. I think there's a lot to be said about that as well. So, yeah. And I mean, as we come out further and further, hopefully of, uh, the worst of like pandemic lockdown, mm-hmm. I'm not sure, you know, exactly how that's going to go, but people will hopefully be curious about different things, but it is a matter of, I think right now, the whole situation with vodka, I don't know that people really even know what questions to ask about that to get to this answer yet. So we have to be arming people with the right questions to right. ask. And I guess that would start with, let's start focusing on base material of vodka. Let's make, or I think everything really, but vodka is a good one to start with. Mm-hmm. Start asking people what this product is made from. And then hopefully that will get them to say, oh, it's made from red winter wheat. And here's what we are doing. And this is why you have this flavor profile at the very end, because this treatment of, of this material, because it is going to be a lot of work to get people to, to, to undo so much very effective marketing that's happened over, you know, just that's, it's basically rewriting people's brains on how they think about this whole category, which is a very big undertaking. And I think no one person is going to do it entirely yeah. themselves. Yeah. I definitely agree with you. I think this is like, there's so much history with vodka and especially exactly. from like, you know, the national level and, you know, historically, but also personally, I think vodka drinkers are vodka drinkers because they love vodka. Yeah. Like that's what they drink. So the idea of something new coming out, uh, I'm not sure they're ready for it. I'm not sure they're to your point, even though it's a possibility anymore. Right. So I think, you know, exposing them to something new might be a little bit of a, um, a pushback from the consumer perspective. Um, so education, yeah. I think is going to be a really important part and showing the possibilities of what vodka truly can be, um, I think is, is going to be exciting, but also a lot of work, um, yes. to your point. So yeah. I'm going to kind of flip this around a little bit. Um, and as a business owner and as a distiller, mm-hmm. what excites you about this change? Like what's Everything. this mean from a production perspective and where is this like, think about how crazy you can get now within this new law. Like what are some of the possibilities you can see? Yeah, I think it's the whole thing is just so it's to me such a move in the right direction for, I mean, for vodka, obviously, but also I think for the spirits industry as a whole, Mm -hmm. this kind of removal of a definition that didn't serve the category or the entire industry, because to me, what is and will always be interesting about spirits is how you can create a character or flavor just from the raw ingredients they're using and then carry that through and concentrate it into the final product. That is marvelous to me. It's 
still something I think that a lot of people don't necessarily think of when they think of spirits right off the bat, but it's changing all the time and people are getting more and more interested in that. Mm -hmm. Um, The thing with vodka though, is it is definitely the hardest spirit. I'm going to go out and say it hardest spirit, unaged vodka. And obviously there's not many aged, but purely unaged vodkas with character, the new type of vodka that we have available got to be the hardest spirit to make period. So, because you have nothing to hide behind, right? right? Like you have, there is just this product. So you cannot cover it up with oak character from mm-hmm. a barrel. You could flavor it, but then, you know, we're, we're changing what we are. We're going into a slightly different, like we're branching off to a slightly different road, but pure unaged vodka, no flavoring that has character that's really hard to do well. Right. And it's not a skill set that was prioritized previously to the same degree, I think, as whiskey distilling mm-hmm. because it there wasn't much of a demand for it. And it didn't really technically exist until last year in this country. So we are going to need to see, and I think that's very exciting. I think it's an opportunity, but distillers need to kind of re- think how they are going to approach this because it's not going to be you can't just make this the same way as you make your whiskey because you are probably making a whiskey with the mindset of this is going to age and so I can let you know these compounds in and I can have this kind of initial character knowing that it will age out and through the oak and the microoxidation and everything else it will eventually become this very palatable wonderful spirit you can't take that same approach with, with completely unaged vodka that still has character. So it's going to re- require a lot of skill development probably sure. from distillers. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that skill plus the demand side from the consumer are, they're going to have to meet somewhere. And hopefully that, that is a very yeah. profitable space. Uh, hopefully more growth, you know, for this but- category. This is kind of like what you were saying. This is where y'all come in, you bartenders, because you guys have to... So when we're talking about characterful vodkas and we're talking about classic vodka vehicles, for instance, a vodka cranberry and a vodka that was made from, you know, certain... I've had a vodka made from red winter wheat and barley that had this really amazing kind of malty character naturally. Those two things will not go together perfectly. It's not going to taste, it's not going to taste, it might not taste good. And that's yeah. not anybody's fault. That's not. I'm having a hard time putting those two things together. Yeah. <laughs> that is, and, and so like, we got to get to a point where bartenders also are like, okay, you know, come on in. You're asking for a vodka cranberry with this vodka. Maybe not the perfect vodka. Maybe right. keep this vodka in the drink and switch it up and make, you know, something different, something that plays up these multi flavors or, or really accentuates that in a way that it's not clashing. It's going to take more effort on everybody's part so that, you know, a person who's interested doesn't get a cocktail where it's just not really being uh, emphasized its flavors. The inherent flavors aren't being emphasized to the best of their capabilities. Sure. And so I assume there's going to be a lot of discovery from a distillation perspective, like, you know, because it has been so focused on clean, neutral, flavorless and all that. Now it's a, all right, now let's go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we have at our disposal as far as a base ingredient, what survives that very violent process of distillation in a positive way, (laughs) right? It's a good description. And then how can we, is it pleasant to drink? Is this good? Is this something that's right. worth our reputation to put out? That kind of thing. Yes. That's yeah. a long time. That's a lot of research. That's a lot of money. <laughs> it's a lot of money. And it's, and you know, it's the, the side of the industry that's more historically been more our source of innovation, which I wouldn't, I don't think anybody would be upset with me saying that typically that smaller producers have really kind of been in America, a really, you know, driving force of innovation in in this industry, Mm -hmm. they don't always have the money or the facility that makes it fiscally sensible to, to play around with this. So 
it's kind of a question also of like, where is this, where is this going to come from, especially during this period of time where there's not necessarily a huge demand for this product simply because people don't know that it's really out there. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause I remember like when TTB lifted the ban on absinthe, it was, yeah. I mean, there was a couple of people that were pretty early into that, you know, into that space. I think St. not St. George, but anchor distilling. I think somebody was in the Bay area jumped right yeah. on it. Um, yeah. And there was a couple other people that were really primed to take, take advantage of that. But I mean, nobody knew about that. I mean, I still talk to people now. They're like, really? You can buy absinthe? I'm like, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that was 15 years ago. And that's a, that's a product that had, you know, so much lore and right. mystique that made people at least gave people the ability to recognize what it is. You know, you don't, you can ask just about anybody who's of drinking age and they'll know what absinthe is at mm -hmm. least. Yeah. Maybe we need to come up with the, a similar kind of story behind vodka. Let's say that corn is is not allowed in the United States. <laughs> well, somebody needs to make something and like that ingredient needs to be like the forbidden fruit. Like exactly. you can't do it. It's, it's forbidden. <gasps> you can't distill it. And Wait. then somebody does it and they're like, oh. <gasps> I'm going to, I'm going to give everybody now a really great idea because I'm too busy with my own thing, but forbidden fruit as an entire brand. And it's all using fruits that are otherwise, I think like there's an apple in South America that I think is poisonous if you eat it on its own raw, but maybe not in the, just after the distilling process. Right. And so it's all made from forbidden fruits hey i love this well and hey. evidently i think what is it cashew like yeah cashew is just like the seed that's left over but the fruit around the cashew is supposed to be one of the best things on the entire planet you see phenomenal so if somebody that's could amazing. like like even like make an eau de vie out of that or something like that uh, I'd if be only so... we knew somebody whose whole business premise was that they traveled around and distilled interesting mm. raw materials into how their you, products. How do you feel about the rainforest? Just saying. I'm, I'm a Florida girl. So I basically not the rainforest, but I'm, I'm cool with humidity and heat. So yes. Right. Yeah. So big things in the future then is what I'm hearing. Yeah. It sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I am really interested to see where this kind of goes in the future. Um, I Me think too. vodka has got, um, has been kind of like the whipping child of, of craft cocktails, you know, not deservedly and undeservedly. Um, I yes. think it has its merits and definitely yeah. within the bar community, it has merits financially. Mm -hmm. um, but from an experimental perspective and from an industry perspective, I'm really curious to see where this goes. Um, oddly enough, before I recorded this podcast, I recorded the next podcast and the person on, on that podcast has um, historical ties to vodka. And the stories that she tells are really fascinating. It makes me That's want... So cool us to push a little bit more on uh, the boundaries of vodka to make it more historical and make it a little bit more accurate to what right. she was exposed to in her, in her youth, because it was really, truly cool um, to see the story behind what she experienced as a, as a kid. So um, if, you know, we're able to kind of push even a little bit further uh, and yeah. have something really cool, I think that could be really interesting as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. I have a bit of a tendency to romanticize, um, historical versions of a lot of different products. But I do think that if we can now using all of the technology that we have and all of the expertise attend or attempt to produce a vodka kind of in the same way that they were doing, you know, before it changed and before the neutrality thing became so much a part of it. Yeah. Potentially you can make such gorgeous spirits. I mean, think about the spirits that you can, you can really, create something that has so much character and that has potentially you know what if there was a world in the near future where the united states has different regional vodkas that's so cool that's so interesting that cool yeah and that can absolutely happen you know we have different regions that have typical kind of uh vegetables and fruits and whatever that are there and we can capture that in a bottle and it right. could be something that people know about and want to try i think that would be so interesting and wonderful you paint a very lovely picture <laughs> i am a little bit of an idea well. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's not often the case that it works out exactly how i have it in my head i have a problem 
I have to always manage my expectations because I can run a little wild. I'm romantic like that, but I think, I think we can get to something that's closer to that than what the neutral monster, you know, like let's, let's put the neutral monster to bed for a while. I'm I'm sure it'll always be kind of lurking around. There'll always be neutral vodkas for people who like it, but there's so much potential with characterful vodkas, the flavorful vodkas. I'm yeah. super excited. I can't wait to see more and more products come out. Um, so where can people either contact you or learn more about some of the things that you're doing uh, if they're interested? Sure. If people are interested, um, you know, we are on a lot of the social media sites if you guys want to reach out. So it's basically just at Liba, L-I-B-A spirits doc, no, at Liba spirits for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and then leave spirits.com. We have, you know, I'm, I'm a writer by trade. So I have written some pieces on the website and I'll be doing more now that I can kind of be a little bit less focused on the sales side of our business. So that is a great place to, to uh, catch up with us and find out what we're doing. But also just, if you want to reach out, if you're curious about things, distilling anything related to the business, um, my email is Devin at Liba Spirits and my business partner who is the production side is Colton, C-O-L-T-O-N at Liba Spirits. And like, we're always down to chat. Very DTC. cool. Well, yeah. thank you very much. And last question is, sure. uh, is there anything exciting you guys have that you would love to promote or talk about? Oh, well, um, yes, of course. There's always something <laughs> exciting in my world. Um, I mean, our first two products I'm really genuinely jazzed about. I think that they did really capture kind of the idea that we were going for. So we made a uh, gin in Austria called 1643 in Southern Austria mm-hmm. with Austrian and Italian botanicals. And then we made a rum in New Orleans called Laugh Cadio. That's a botanical rum as well. Very cool. And I think those are both excellent products. And if you want to learn more, please check those out. And I also, we are going to be coming out with a newsletter that is, so I've been trying to figure out how I can kind of like give people my honest travel opinions, because that's such a big part of my life, but I don't want to kind of put too much pressure on establishments, you know, bars, restaurants, and things like that. But I figured if I just put it in a newsletter and it's not super public and I can be real upfront with all my suggestions, all of my like, you know, completely candid feelings about where I've been. So that's what we're going to do. And I think it'll just be a newsletter on our website. Perfect. Excellent. So we'll have Mm -hmm. links to that in uh, over at abarabove.com in the show notes. Um, But Devin, I can't thank you enough. It's so great to talk to you. And uh, I'm sure we have some great spirits in our future that we can chat about. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So once again, thank you to Devin from Leva Spirits. Um, I can't thank her enough for her time, her expertise, and her thoughts on kind of what the new trajectory of vodka could potentially mean for us um, and for distillers as well. So we'll have all the links in the show notes over at abarabove.com. So definitely go check those out. um, And we'll have some more podcasts for you in the future. Now, if you like cocktails, and I know you do if you're listening to this podcast, I highly recommend checking out our bar tools over at abarabove.com. These bar tools are created basically out of all the frustrations I had um, behind the bar. So this addresses a lot of those issues. And we've come up with what we think is probably some of the best bar tools in the world. Um, So check those out over at abarabove.com. And uh, yeah, we'll have some more podcasts for in the future. Cheers, everyone.